our two guests today are, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this already, I'm really sorry, Carla Feuerstein? Yes, Feuerstein. Ex Feuerstein. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Carla Feuerstein is a Glasgow-based sound engineer, sound engineer who started her career at a young age as a stagehand for her father, German sound man and musician Guntmar Feuerstein. Uh, she moved to Glasgow in 2011, where she studied sound production at Stowe College as one of only four women attending the course. Today, she works with some of the top bands in the Scottish folk scene, such as Heisk and the Paul McKenna Band. She can also regularly be found behind the mixing desk at venues such as St Luke's, Drygate, SWG3, the CCA and the Glad Cafe. Claire Hibbard is the sound lecturer on the BA Production Technology Management course at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. She graduated from the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in 2004. In 2013, she completed a PGCE at Canterbury Christ Church University in Kent, which led to teaching science at a large comprehensive school for two years. She's recently completed her PG cert in higher arts education at RCS. Her previous sound work includes Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, um, Chichester Festival Theatre's Summer Season, Nicholas Nickleby, Mamma Mia, Love Never Dies, Shrek the Musical, Matilda the Musical, and she was the senior sound technician at the Royal Opera House Muscat in Oman. Uh, welcome, both of you, Claire and Carla. Um, I'm going to get us started with a question. Um, a lot of our audiences will be school-age pupils, um, and I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you were like at school and did you always know, did you always want to do what you do now? Uh, and I'll start, I'll kick us off with Claire, if that's okay. Um, well, when I was at school, I did a lot of music um, and I did a lot of dancing outside of school. Um, but as I became a teenager, it became very clear that I was not a performer. Um, and I didn't like being stood on stage. Uh, I had a really good music teacher though, who uh, recognised this and listened to me, I suppose, and suggested that I helped out with the sound and lighting for a school production. Uh, and I did that and I met a group of people um, and that was when I was about 15 or 16. And then I just loved it um, and didn't want to do anything else. And that's um, how I applied to, uh, that's how I got to go to Central. Um, I was quite a quiet uh, student at school. I worked really hard and uh, yeah, I suppose, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, I enjoyed school though, um, yeah. Excellent, and how about you, Carla? Um, well, when I was in school back home in Germany, um, first of all, I was terrible at all the maths and physics and technology stuff. So at the time, I didn't really, at the time, I would have never thought that I'd be in a fairly technological career. Um, I was also in, in, I was in my school drama group in a school band, um, but I, much like Claire, didn't really feel too comfortable in the spotlight. Um, and I was already um, helping my dad at gigs quite a lot. Um, but at the time, I don't think I really considered that to be a career. Maybe it was like an act of rebellion against my yes. parents I decided no no I'm gonna get a real job um but yeah I was um I was definitely um not into sciencey stuff um but I I was a very visual learner as well so once I could get like my hands on something I usually could wrap my head around the the, the theory behind it but I am um, yeah I was not good with all of the physics around sound waves and maths and calculations terrible <laughs> Um, what was your, for both of you, what was your first job in the creative industries? Um, and you can interpret it, you can interpret first job however you like, because there's lots of different uh, starting points for people. Um, we go with Claire first. Um, my first job, um, I was really lucky that I was at Central and um, it was close to the West End and there were people in the years above me that uh, were depping, which means uh, you go into um, West End musicals and you just cover uh, backstage plots. Um, and one of my pals who was in, I think he was in the year above me, maybe two years above me, 
um, was depping on Blood Brothers. And when he graduated, he got a full time job there. So then a role came up there. So I used to go every Thursday night for £30 and debt on Blood Brothers. And I did that for nearly two years. <laughs> I covered all the holidays and things which I thought was in, in, incredibly, it was, it, it felt completely crazy because I'd never been backstage in a professional theatre, let alone in a West End theatre. And it was very, very intimidating and very scary. Um, but I soon, it was a good, it was a good couple of years because I found my place uh, and I, I learned a lot of skills, mainly to be a bit more confident and speak up for myself, because there were a lot of personalities, as you can imagine. I can imagine, yeah, yeah. And how about you, Carla? What was your first job? Um, my first job that I got on my own without my my mum and dad basically giving me work um, was, I think, was um, the Glatt Cafe here in Glasgow. Um, I um, I got an, an, a work experience placement with them through Stowe College and um, I did quite well and they kept me on as like the, the assistant sound engineer so I, um, I got to do all the solo singer-songwriter um, gigs for a while. That was really, yeah, that was my first proper job here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think something that's quite interesting for me, I'm going off piste already, I'm going off my questions already, so I do apologise. Um, probably quite interesting for me in, to kind of learn a little bit, um, sort of music and sound engineering and, and that side of things is totally not my world. So can you sort of explain in, in terms that somebody who knows nothing about what you do, um, what you do? Uh, we go with Claire first, if that's okay. Um, well... I could sort I could speak for days about this because uh, <laughs> sound engineering is massive and there's lots of different specialities within that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the area that I was mainly involved with. So I've always been um, working in theatre, uh, and then, like I was just saying, my I certainly started on large scale musical theatre stuff. Um, and when you do that, um, then you have um, a front of house engineer, what we would call a sound number one, who mixes most of the shows. Uh, and then depending on the size of the show, a sound number two that would cover that. And by mixing, I mean that you have a channel on your sound desk for every uh, microphone that is on an instrument or a person uh, and you balance the levels. Um, and on musicals, um, those desks these days, you tend to use digital desks and they're very heavily programmed. So it's a bit like um, playing an instrument and you're listening to the levels and uh, adjusting those accordingly for every scene. So if somebody walks on stage, you turn their microphone on and they walk off and you, you turn the microphone off again uh, and times that by however many microphones you have on your orchestra or your, um, on people on stage. So it's quite full on um, and uh, intense, I suppose. You have to be very good at concentrating uh, and listening. Um, and then the other roles within that. So the roles that I did mix a few shows, but my main thing that I really love, I still love now and I love then, was to be working backstage. So in that role, you do a lot of the um, problem solving. So. Um, uh, on, in musical theatre, performers tend to wear radio mics, so putting batteries in the radio mics, fitting the microphones to people, or heads normally, or wherever they are on their body, and um, checking that all of those microphones work before uh, the show starts. So if you imagine uh, an orchestra pit full of musical instruments with microphones on them, um, you, your responsibility is to go around before the show and test all of those. And then sometimes things happen, you know, this is live performance. Sometimes things break during a performance um, and it's your responsibility to go and sort it out because uh, at the end of the day, people are paying a lot of money normally for these tickets or 50 pounds upwards for a seat. Um, and they expect a perfect quality sound. So you're on, you have to be on standby all the time. Uh, to do any of the fixing of the problems. So it's quite exciting. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's a, a quick summary of, of, uh, <laughs> of that, yeah. And how about you, Carla? Like, I, I suppose what you do is sort of similar in some ways, but very different in others. Yeah, it's similar. Um, the mixing aspect is similar. So I too have 
um, an input on my a channel on my desk for every instrument and every microphone um, on stage. But I work mostly in, in live music, um, all kinds of genres, rock and folk and sometimes EDM. Um, and what I do is basically when people ask me, I say everything that happens on stage, if you're in a big venue, I make it loud enough for you to be able to hear it in the audience or when I'm not mixing for the audience, when I'm mixing um, monitors on stage, I make it so that the band can hear themselves on stage and can perform well together. And that's what I do. Um, that is one of the aspects of it. But um, as Claire said, there's also in my line of work, there's the, the backstage kind of aspect or the stage aspect. Um, so when you are at, uh, at festivals or at gigs, um, the stage is often used by different bands throughout the day. And uh, what I do as well is I'm one of the people who carries out the busy change of us between gigs, just runs across the stage with a bunch of microphones, puts them in the right <laughs> place, and then very quickly plugs them in within five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> So it's like, quite, a, quite a stressful job. I'm getting sort of palpitations <laughs> just thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what's been the kind of standout moments for both of you in your careers so far? Uh, if we go to Carla first, I realise I keep coming, picking on Claire. Um, oh, in 2019, during the, the Celtic Connection Festival, um, I was there with Heisk and we actually got to do a gig at the Royal Concert Hall, which was, it was just amazing. It's a beautiful venue to, to mix in and to, you know, to have a band like Heisk and be able to really, you know, make the most of the space and the sound system and not having to worry about um, the drums being too loud for the room or anything like that. It was just great mixing that massive, like, desk and the huge big PA and for quite a large crowd as well that was really really good. <laughs> How about you Claire? Um, well I, I was just been trying to think about this question <laughs> I've been thinking about <laughs> it and um, yeah I, I've had experiences similar to Carla where I've been mixing to a lot of people and the um, one that I, I think stands out to me is um, I was on the Mamma Mia international tour and we were touring in arenas. Um, and I remember one particular night in Taiwan, and I think there was nearly 3,000 people in the audience, and mm -hmm. they went crazy for ABBA. And, <laughs> we, and I love ABBA, by the way. <laughs> Don't judge me. Um, so that was, that was incredible. But actually, um, and th there's been lots of experiences like that where it's been, you, and it's very difficult to describe what it's like to be stood either in front of house or on the side of the stage when you know what is what the audience are experiencing is such an incredible thing. Um, but I think um, if I were to reflect on everything, then it would be um, some of the people that I've met along the way, because you don't meet people like you meet people in, in theatre and uh, live uh, events in real life you just don't there's some real interesting characters out there and um it really it really shapes you as a person so i've made some uh, brilliant friends and had some really really good times with yeah so it, it's yeah sorry that doesn't really it's, it's not no, one that's a, thing but <laughs> no that's a really good one i think because i think sometimes you know we're talking about career highlights and stuff we can forget about the sort of personal side of, mm -hmm. of work you know you spend most of your time at work sometimes so you might as well like the people that you're working with <laughs> or you you want to hope that you like the people you're working with yes. um yeah so that's huge um were there what's been the kind of surprising things about your job uh, your jobs that you you didn't know about before you started and we go with Claire mm. first. <laughs> um, surprising things. Well, I suppose when I was really young, <laughs> when I was just getting into it, I thought it was going to be super uh, glamorous. I, 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 I wasn't completely naive to it, but I thought that um, I'd have more time, I suppose, and more money. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that's the, I, I don't think you can uh, overestimate the amount of work that you have to put in. Uh, it's it's it is really you really do have to put your all into it and I never imagined that um yeah so for things so things like um I've moved countries 
you know, to to do a job that I really wanted to do. Mm. And that's often meant leaving family and friends behind. Um, and my <laughs> dedication, I suppose, to the job has almost come above all of that. Uh, mm. And I never thought I was going to be that person uh, that would that would uh, live a life like that. But um, yeah, I suppose that's been the most surprising thing, especially looking back at it now. Yeah. How about you, Carla? What's... Yeah, I think on, on that note, I was um, one day surprised to see that all, all my all my friends that I'm, you know, that I socialize with, I social that those are all colleagues as well as mm -hmm. friends. And um, the line is really thin and sometimes blurred. And um, mm -hmm. that can be that can be lovely. And sometimes it is really difficult as well. I think I was um, that was definitely a learning cur curve, like learning how to you know, have a professional relationship with people that have mm -hmm. also seen you do really silly things, yes. you know, <laughs> outside yeah. of work. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was, that is something that, I don't know, it wasn't a surprise as such, but it was certainly something that I had to learn how to navigate. Mm -hmm. But um, what I hadn't really thought about when I first got into, um, when I first started working at the Glad Cafe, it was just me behind the desk and on lights, and I guess a stage manager as well. Um, but when I started working bigger gigs, I was very pleasantly surprised to see that there's actually usually a person for each job. It's not just one, mm -hmm. one girl behind the, all the desks. Um, <laughs> and I found that, um, yeah, that was just great to see, you know, at, at one of my first bigger gigs at SWG3, there's, you know, a stage technician, there's a front of house technician, there's a monitor engineer, and then there's, you know, your lighting people. And it's just... Um, it's just really fascinating to see how a venue works. It's mm -hmm. like a very intricate mechanism, you know, like a clockwork. There's all the tiny moving parts. Um, that's really cool. Absolutely. That sounds, yeah. That's kind of chiming with uh, sort of what, what the other people have said in our creative conversations, actually, about um, sort of when you start out that you often have to do a bit of everything and, yeah. and kind of... Uh, yeah, sort of get your, sort of pay your dues almost before you kind of are able to focus on something. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a, a question from the the audience now, which uh, I'm gonna ask now. Um, you're both women working in a predominantly male industry. Um, what advice would you give to any young women that are interested in sound production and engineering? If you will have a free for all there. <laughs> um, I would say really ask ask for opportunities and don't be shy to to contact people that you've met once who said oh you should give me a shout at some point if you want if you want a better work experience just do it because I think if someone gives you their number and says you know contact mm -hmm. me if you want some work experience they'll be delighted to hear from you and um, I think that is, is the best you can do for yourself is keep in touch with people and directly tell them what you want what you want from them and how they can maybe help you because you never if you don't ask you don't get and um I at the at the start of my career I think I was quite shy to to ask people for shadowing opportunities or work experience but when I did get more direct about it I found that lots of people men and women alike are usually really happy to pass on their knowledge and there's very little um I've, I've never encountered anyone who said, oh, no, no, don't be silly. You can't come work for me. No, no, no. No, I totally agree. You, re you do really have to put yourself out there a little bit. Um, and I say this to my students all the time. It feels really awkward to start with because you're not used to going up to people and saying, oh, can I come and shadow you? But you have to. You, you yeah. absolutely have to if you want to get on and you want to get noticed. You sort of have to sell yourself a little bit um put yourself in the right place at the right time and meet the people because a lot of this is about networking um and yes we are women in a predominantly male uh, environment but things are changing hugely since i started out certainly um, and there is a lot of support available and um, there's groups like women in live music um uh, there's a Scottish group as well, I think uh, Scottish Women in Music as well, uh, and Sound Girls, 
Um, they all have brilliant support networks that you can be part of. So I would absolutely recommend that people get on board with those because um, they didn't exist and that was a gap. Um, and when they did come into those, all of those groups started forming, it really changed things. Um, I, I don't know whether you had that experience, Carla. I don't know whether you're in any of those groups. I am, yeah, I'm. I am, and um, there's there's another one, the Bit Collective as well. Oh yeah. And Scottish yeah. Women Inventing Music. Uh, I actually taught a live sound workshop for them. Okay. Um, not last year, the year before, 2019, mm. um, which was really great. It was um, it was at the Glad Cafe, and they had um, we had 15 girls in who are oh, you yeah. know. I showed them how to use a desk and stuff and it was a bit awkward at first because everyone's just like I don't know what all these knobs do I don't want to mess it up but you know once it was so great to see them just messing about with the reverbs and mm -hmm. you know with the equalizer that was that was lovely and there's um stuff like that happening all the time so if you once we do get to go back into venues and stuff I'm sure there will be plenty of opportunities to get some some hands-on experience yeah Definitely. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that thing about um, sort of not being afraid to reach out to people is quite a, is another thing that's coming out of all of these conversations and and sort of staying in touch with people that you've met and and mm -hmm. maybe people who've offered to stay in touch with you. Um, I think when I because I'm a sort of outside of working for the conservatoire, I'm a filmmaker, and I think oh. when I first started out, um, I had this feeling of you know, oh, I'm not going to bother people. And I, I always used to feel dead, like, weird and shy about kind of mm. approaching people. Um, and now, like, occasionally I'll get sort of email, I've got a couple of emails today, uh, weirdly enough, from people sort of asking for advice or sort of looking for something from me. And and I'm not thinking, oh, my God, get away. Like, I'm not interested in helping you out. My, my sort of, I guess, guilt when I get those kind of emails is, um, I don't know if I've got time to to give this the time that I think it needs. Like I think mm -hmm. there is a, you know, there's often a, an appetite to, to sort of bring people up with you or sort of, yeah, not pulling the ladder up behind you, um, which I think can sometimes be a bit of a myth about the creative industries. Oh, yeah. yeah, oh, totally. But I think about it that way. If you, I mean, if I, if I think about the, the people that I used to pe pester about, about shadowing and work experience, they taught me, you know, how they like stuff done on stage and how they like everything labeled, how they like their cables coiled. Yes. I can, I know what they, I know exactly how to run their stages now, which yes. makes me quite valuable. Mm -hmm. And they've taught me, so they know they can trust me. They can hire me for, for bigger jobs now. And they can, you know, if, if they put me in charge of, of, of the stage, they know it's gonna be run the way they like it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's um, for, as an entry level job, especially, that's, um, you're making yourself uh, almost indispensable. If you know exactly what sound engineer, especially the monitor engineers, how they like their stage to be laid out and how to patch everything. I mean, you could be, you could be getting a lot of work that way, I think. I agree. <laughs> Um, did you did either of you face any barriers in getting into the arts and how did you overcome them? Not, I didn't, I, no, not massive barriers. A lot of, I mean, there were a lot of awkward situations that could have put me off, I suppose. Like a lot of people coming into venues asking me where the sound engineer is, you know, or just little things that have been said. Oh, what a weird job for a for a girl and that kind of stuff. I, you know, the the biggest thing or the biggest obstacle I was found was working when I was working festivals there was often not a lot of consideration put into um where the female members of the tech team might sleep mm -hmm. and um there was one festival that I worked where all the tech crew were <laughs> sleeping in a barn without a toilet and running water Wow. And I unfortunately had my period that weekend. So it was kind of, that was a little bit of an awkward conversation I had to be had with certain people. But if you, 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 you shouldn't be afraid to have those conversations. That's, you, you unfortunately still sometimes have to stand up for yourself in slightly awkward ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, I think um, one of the things 
from my and this was quite a long time ago I'm quite old I think one of the things <laughs> at school was that and you got to remember that the internet didn't really exist when I was at school so you couldn't google you know sound courses or anything so in those days you had to look in a big UCAS book and flip through and read about the courses and then apply to them uh, and then when you visited them that was your interview then there was no like virtual tours or anything like that and I I always felt at school that um, people were sort of a bit like oh you know why I remember my geography teacher saying why don't you do geography or science or something you know something a bit more mainstream you know why are you why are you going off to do that um but that, my parents were quite supportive actually surprisingly so um that wasn't that was I, I sort of just ignored it you just sort of you know when you want to do something don't you and this it just seems so exciting but I also knew when I um started getting into teaching a bit more but it felt this it was the same sort of feeling like this was something I was really very passionate about and very interested in and I could see how I could join the two things together um so go with your you know go with your interests and your gut instinct it doesn't just because you do what you 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 go into one area doesn't mean that you can't add to that later on it's only going to be a strength working in the arts it makes you so resilient and so tough sleeping in a barn with no running water I mean you know if you can get through that you can pretty much get through anything <laughs> yeah I think so. and you're just doing it for your passion aren't you you're doing it because you love doing what yeah. you do. I got yeah. to mix Lulu that day. It was there great. we are. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> exactly. You, you, do, you do end up doing some slightly crazy things. Oh, you do. Um, but what you get out of it is, like, it's just incredible. I, I can't put into words um, some of those experiences. You, you just have to live it. <laughs> I think um, yeah, that's another thing I, I think that's coming out of these conversation is that um, the, the sense of how much you're willing to put yourself in situations that might be out of your comfort zone can sometimes be a sort of a way of testing how much you actually want to do what you do. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think sometimes I, I, I guess when I was at school, I would have found it really difficult to imagine some of the things I've done or mm -hmm. to imagine being in some of the rooms I've been in or meeting some of the people I've met and like being able to do that. But, you know, it's a, it's a gradual process and, and there's a lot of learning along the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it is gradual. Uh, yeah, and you might think now, oh, I find it really hard talking to people or I find, you know, that's a really difficult thing I did as well. And I literally have to tell myself to go you know to walk into the room and talk to one person come on and slowly slowly the more you do it it's practice isn't it the easier it becomes but it does take a while so you just have to be a little bit kind to yourself when you're starting out yeah. it's not all going to come at once but on the note of you know working in, in crazy situations I would say my advice would also be remember that just because you're a woman a young woman in a male dominated field you don't need to prove anything to anyone you don't need to or you shouldn't um you shouldn't feel like you need to work harder than everyone else just to you know just to be accepted or just to be let into the rooms that are to the areas that you want to be in basically if someone you know denies you access to a field because you didn't you know work twice as hard as the boys just go somewhere else like yeah. there's so many people that you can surround yourself with um, mm -hmm. that will not require you to to be twice as good as everybody else mm -hmm. as the boys basically mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely yeah you know that you can walk away from something oh yeah uh, and I've, I've I've done it I'm sure you have as well Carly you get to the point where you yeah. think no I can't cope with this anymore you know you know you, you know what your limits are um yeah. and because it's such a hard physically taxing job you need to make sure you you, you keep well mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. Mm. There'll, there'll always be something else over the horizon there'll be some there'll be another another door opening um even when you feel like it's not going to it, it will you have, to, you have to trust yourself we've got a, a question from the audience um about the dreaded uh pandemic how has the pandemic changed uh what you do um, and, and are you able to get work 
uh, during the pandemic, which is a really difficult question. Um, so <laughs> feel free to answer it if you if you want to. Have you not gotten any work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've not worked in not in sound in a long, long time. Um, yeah, so last March when the lockdown came into place, I had my last gig and I've not, um, yeah, I've not done a gig since. I did my first um, live gig last weekend at um, a recording studio and the gig was live streamed and it was kind of like a little festival. There were several bands and we had five minute change of us. Whew, muscle memory kicked in and I remembered <laughs> all the moves. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been really tough. Um, I, I got another, I got a COVID job as I call it. I got a got job in customer service just to get me through this year. Um, but um, as of a month from now, I will not be having that job any longer and I'll be hopefully going back into, into small gigs. And, you know, I think we all have to kind of adapt a little bit. I think I will be doing a lot more live streams and um, that kind of stuff. Mm. Interesting. And um, my job is very different these days because I've gone into education. So um, I count myself really lucky because a few years ago, three years ago, three and a half years ago, um, I too would have um, found myself not being able to do any shows or anything at this time. But um, our course has continued and we have uh, had a lot of restrictions, but we've managed to do um, quite a lot of the productions with no audience um, but we've also been uh, recording we haven't been live streaming but um, we might do some of that next year um, but we have been doing a lot of recording so um, although the industry hasn't been around so much we have continued so I've been able to do what I do but it's it's not so much um, running shows anymore I sort of oversee several shows going on and quite a lot of students doing those shows. Um, but yeah, I think um, what Carla was saying about adaptability is really important because it's not um, just in COVID times that you might find yourself um, with a couple of weeks thinking, oh, I don't have any work this week. I need to go and do something else. Um, but know that that's absolutely fine. And if you go off and do something else, doesn't mean that you can't come into another job you know the next time and yeah and that has happened and it does happen anyway um it's yeah it's about being adaptable and being uh, you know resilient and a little bit tough about it and you know telling yourself that that's absolutely fine and you just continue continue carry on um keep aiming for what you want to do absolutely i think that's great advice sort of outside of um you know the pandemic and stuff mm -hmm. and um even as you know it feels like things are starting to gear up now i'm starting to see like theaters are uh, sort of booking shows and and things like yeah. that so it's yeah it's getting excited and i think there'll be such an appetite for it once once people can get back out and yeah. go to see live yeah. music and live theater um absolutely um where's my questions so the question here, what type of work experience would you recommend to someone who's thinking about studying, uh, you know, sound production or sound engineering at somewhere like the Conservatoire? Mm -hmm. um, I would say do everything that you can get your hands on. So school productions, uh, amateur productions, um, start your networking. This is a good time to start it. You're, if you meet someone at school that's quite interested in it, they're bound to know other shows that are going on in the area. Um, it's difficult during COVID, um, but it doesn't mean that you can't start making connections. Uh, there's lots of groups around. So the ones that we were talking about, the women's groups, but also Association of Sound Designers uh, is good for theatre. Sign up to all of those and get to know people. And um, like you're saying, Michael, if you email people and ask them for advice, um, we've had some amazing, our students have reached out to some sound designers um, with amazing results and they have done Zoom um, interviews with them and all oh, sorts wow. of things over COVID. So um, you might not, some of those people you might not get a reply to, which is fine. You don't know, you know what's going on in their lives and whether they're busy or not, but um, start chatting to people, especially at this time, and then um, go and see um, whether that's online at the moment or when things open up, just go and see things um, and get a real feeling for what's going on out there. 
Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, if you want to get into, if you're looking to get into live music stuff, um, just ask engineers that you know if you can come, if you can come in for the for sound check and for setup even, and just you know get a feel for what it's like. Um, to be at a venue, get chatting with the, the technicians and, um, uh, you know, ask them for shadowing opportunities and, um, mm -hmm. yeah, try and, like, you know, pick up little jobs as early as you can. There's there's definitely stuff that, you know, you will feel slightly underqualified for, but are you really? You're probably, you'll probably do all right. You'll learn on the job and, you know, there's always people to ask for help. No one's going to be mad if you if you don't know something and you ask the only time people will get slightly annoyed if you at, at you will be if you just if you run away and do stuff completely wrong without asking <laughs> that's bad <laughs> but you know if, if you if you're open about it if you're saying i don't know how to do this can you show me so i know for next time no one will be angry at you no one will you know think any less of you i love it when people ask questions and i love it when people double check with me to to make sure that they're doing it the way you know, I would like. Yeah. I, I think on that sort of reaching out to people front, I think there's a, um, a sense of uh, if, you know, if you send a nice polite email to somebody or you kind of get in touch with somebody in a polite way, nobody is going to tell you to get lost. Or, no, you know, ever. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, the worst, the worst that can happen is they don't respond because they don't have time. Um, so yeah, it's worth a chat, worth a, worth a uh, chance. I would recommend the people that are watching now uh, make that their, their sort of resolution for the next yeah, week to bold. get in touch with someone. Yeah. <laughs> yes, do it. Yes. And if they don't respond, just email them again in a month. And, yeah, you know, because they might have been busy. Who knows? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we're coming up to the end of our time, so if anyone's got any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Uh, any last questions? Let's see if I have any. Um, would there be one piece of advice that you would give someone who who's maybe heard what you've said today and thinks oh, I want to give? Uh, give that a go, what would your one piece of advice be? Um, I'm not sure I can say one. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, you can say more than one if you like. <laughs> well, if you're already enrolled in a course, I would say that's very good. Good job. Um, I would say really do make, make the resolution to email someone today or tomorrow um, and have a look at those groups um, relevant for Scotland would be Scottish Women Inventing Music, The Bit Collective, Women in Life Music it's a very good one and have a look maybe maybe look up all the local sound companies if you're interested in live sound mm -hmm. for music and um, have a look at those because um, there's oof, there's plenty of them in Glasgow at least three big ones that you could that you could contact nice people for uh, advice. Yes, definitely. Um, what was I going to say? I think that my, if I was going to say one bit of advice is that uh, I agree with everything that Carla just said, but um, do something, just do something about it because nothing is going to come to you um, in this career, in this profession, nothing just well sometimes it does I'm very lucky um, nothing will come to you you have to make a considerable effort so do all of those things uh, and, and even if you do all of those things and then you think next year oh no this isn't what I want to be into it won't be time wasted you'll have learned about a whole new industry so yeah. get completely immersed and stuck in um, but just don't just sit there because then nothing will happen <laughs> Yeah. If you've got musician friends in bands, that's what I did. I just asked if I could do their sound at gigs. And that mm. worked out amazingly because with some of them, I still tour now what, oh, no, when there's no COVID. So that's great. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, use them as guinea pigs, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great advice. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us today. Um, people in the audience, you're going to get a, a evaluation form from 
uh, myself or Becca uh, emailed to you, please fill it in because it helps us to put on stuff like this in the future, always for free. Um, and it also helps us to improve the things that we do. Um, it's always weird trying to end these things on Zoom when there's no audience to like give you a round of applause. But thank you so much uh, for speaking to us today. I've, I've learned a lot um, and, I'm, and I'm sure uh, the people who are watching at home have too. So uh, yes, a weird silent clapping. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and thank everybody at home for, for tuning in. Cheers. Bye. 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 <laughs>